What's good? It's Carrie Jr. from the On the Line. And this week, we're going to feature a show from the Free Press Podcast catalog. This Saturday, the three seed University of Michigan take on number two seed Ohio State Buckeyes. Both teams are undefeated, and this is looking like a high stakes game. So, to get a little bit of insight ahead of Saturday's game, here's Free Press Sports with Carlos and Sean. Hey, folks, welcome to Free Press Sports with Carlos and Sean. Carlos, uh, we've got a few things to talk about this week, I think, and uh, we don't have much time to do it because you apparently have banana bread in the oven, and we want to make sure that you do not burn it. We don't want you getting in trouble with your family. And by the way, did you make this banana bread? I made the banana bread, Sean, because it was the closest thing I could pair. I didn't have any cornbread and Honolulu Blue Kool-Aid for you to drink and eat um, since you're all lions, all in now. And I think I think our guest is, too, because he was tweeting a very interesting picture uh, as your lions were beating up on the poor New York Giants last week. Well, here's what we're going to here's what we're going to do, Carlos, if if this is OK with you. I mean, humbly, respectfully. We're going to react because it's funny because you, you've you talked about the idea of newspapering, news, news cycles, column writing, uh, news, you know, news beat writing, all that sort of stuff. As as not a um, chronicler of, you know, long term, we're not trying to chronicle a decade or a year or 100 years or whatever, but the moment and our people. And when we say our people, the people that we live with and uh, our community is going crazy with the lines right now. So that's really all we're reflecting. We're not projecting. And I think our guest would uh, would double down on that because he's a, unlike us, he actually grew up here. So maybe he's a little bit of an expert. But uh, in any case, we will talk about the Lions because they have won three games in a row and they did beat, as you said, a fraudulent New York Giants team. But now sitting now seven and three team. I, I think you're probably not the only one. It feels like is, that. Is man. Mike Valendi coming after me for saying that? Or does he, I, I haven't heard his show, but he's probably... He's probably just as angry as at the Giants. As I'm sure else. everybody's coming after you because the entire world centers around you and what you say and how people react to it. So I'm sure, <laughs> I mean, without a doubt. But uh, we're going to get to the lines a little bit later um, and delve into uh, this craziness of a three-game winning streak and, um, you know, whether they can actually beat Buffalo on Thanksgiving. Before we do that, though, there's another football game, Carlos, I think, right? Is there? I, I've heard a little bit about And I'm talking about, of course, Michigan State at Penn State. And can they get to uh can they get to a bowl game and pull off an upset of and, ha- and happy valley on Saturday? No, 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 no. Look, yeah, that that's an important game, I guess, for uh, Mel Tucker no, and that not. staff. No. But that's about it. Right. Yeah. We're here to talk about, of course, the game, uh, Michigan, Ohio State, and uh, we're bringing in Tony Garcia. Welcome, Tony. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. That's uh this is what, twice in a month? This is good. Yeah, no, it, it it is good. I like that you invited yourself on the show yesterday. I like that. Co- I like <laughs> it's like Steph Curry taking a three and then running around or running back down the court before he even sees it goes in. It's it's irrational confidence. It's uh, oh, well, man. it's it's well earned though. <laughs> no, no, quite quite the opposite. Um, we I mean we got basketball going on this week. We got a busy week, and you guys know all the behind the scenes with uh, everything that's going on in the sports department. So just. Trying to trying to make sure I was available for for something as important in this should I be needed. <laughs> no, I, I was I was glad you said something, Tony. And thanks thanks uh, for for taking time with us. And for the listeners out there, the listener, excuse me, for the listener out there that uh, maybe not be familiar with Tony Garcia. Shame on you. He is, uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm just kidding. He is uh, our, our beat writer for Michigan. Covers the football team, the basketball team, all things Michigan. We're lucky to have him at the paper, and uh, we're grateful to have him here at the show. So, Tony, uh, tell us, because I know Carlos has lots of questions, but set the scene for uh, what you think might unfold this Saturday down in Columbus. Man, it would be a lot easier to do that if there were was less unknown, right? I mean, what is the status of Blake, Blake Corum and uh, Donovan Edwards, first and foremost, uh, the, the, the two running backs? Um, if either one of them is healthy, Michigan still got a shot. I think you really do need Blake Corum to – even remotely feel good about possibilities headed down to Columbus, but that's question one. Uh, question two is is the passing game, Sean. You and I have been talking about it for for weeks now, um, especially without uh, Edwards, who is important in that passing game, and Luke Schoonmaker, uh, the tight end, who is second on the team in receptions, yards. Uh, he's scored a couple touchdowns. He's just he's really important to just this intermediate passing game, which is what Michigan does because they have not had any success throwing the ball downfield. And so 
Weather matters. Um, it looks like it may be a weather game, which could ha- help a, a run-heavy Michigan team. Um, those are just some of my initial thoughts on that side of the ball. On the other side of the ball, um, Ohio State has some banged up running backs. Uh, Travion Henderson, uh, Mayan Williams, they uh, were one was limited. One didn't really play last week. Uh, and it was the fresh, true freshman running for 150 yards. I mean, you know, Ohio State just has four star, five stars sort of on a, on a, coming out of the stable here. So it's just what is, what is their health? And then, of course, CJ Stroud. Uh, Jim Harbaugh used the phrase Heisman habits to refer to multiple players on, on both Michigan and Ohio State. When he was talking Ohio State, I'm pretty sure he was talking CJ Stroud and then, um, Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, their, do it all wide receiver who was not even supposed to be their best receiver this year. That was supposed to be Jackson Smith and Jigba who has been out for, for the whole year, but ton of talent uh, on Ohio state. I don't think Michigan has seen anything uh, even really remotely like this. If they were healthy, um, I let, then, then they got a, they got a, a puncher's chance uh, if not better, but man, I mean, the, these, these question marks, Mike Morris on the defensive side of the ball, there's just a lot of unknown right now. Carlos, do you have time for a question, or do you have to check the banana? I think we're bread? done. No, I mean the bread. The bread's doing fine, Sean. <laughs> okay, so, uh, we have to be a little quiet so it doesn't uh, so it keeps rising. But no, and t- Tony gave us the whole uh, the whole shebang with. I think he think he threw in some recruiting stuff in there too on top of it. So, um, but yeah, that's that, so, so. Forget all that, all that gobbledygook, Tony. Like, who's got more right? Who who's got more momentum into this thing? I mean, or more motivation? I mean, even if because we don't know who's going to play or whatever, but. But after that beatdown last year in Ann Arbor, I mean, don't you think Ryan Day has just been grinding his teeth for 365 days waiting for this? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I, I would imagine that Ohio State has more. There's no you can't manufacture that feeling of a loss. Right. Like it hurts right. more to lose than it feels good to win. And that's what Michigan has not been suffering with like they did for eight years in a row. Ohio State and Say what you want. If the, if there was a COVID outbreak, if there wasn't a COVID outbreak in 2020, Ohio State thought they were going to get to pummel Michigan by 50 points that year. That didn't happen. They come in last year. Everyone's picking them to win. And then Michigan finally flips the script. It's been three years since Ohio State's got a win in this game. It's been four years since Michigan went to the shoe. And and it's the 100-year anniversary of the horseshoe, might I add. And Ooh. on senior day, obviously, whenever these two sides meet at senior day, it's always the last day of the year. But there is going to... Game day is going to be there. Fox Big Noon kickoff is going to be there. It's number three versus number two. This is the biggest game in the rivalry, and they've had some big ones. Last year was big. 2016 was big. This is the first one since 2006 uh, where, where both sides are undefeated. I mean, the juice, I cannot wait to be in the city and see what it's like. Um, and Ohio State, it, they're, bring, they're going to bring it. You got to, I mean, Michigan's got to know that. And yet, uh, as a region, we are all in on the lines. Right, Tony. I mean, that's just uh, that's just that's just that's just, that's just how it goes. No, I'm kidding about the lines. I mean, it's true, but I'm kidding about uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding about them bringing uh, that. Sean, just for some perspective for the listener, and maybe Tony doesn't know. Sean has two sons who are big Lions fans, and that's where he reads all of his emotions and no, and the, no, the no, no. Detroit off of his what no, is kids I are just, feeling uh, good or bad. No, about. I actually talked to our sports editor who has a uh, who has access to uh, what we call analytics and metrics in the Lions. The lines uh, just because you're clicking on your own story several times. No, mean that is that is nothing to do with. It. That has nothing to do with. It. Here's here's the it, Tony. You know this. I don't want to get too distracted. So what the lions represent are Michigan and Michigan State yeah. fans. Yeah, right? the, the, the fan base isn't split. Yeah, exactly. Oh. So and so it's just it's just math, and I don't know if they teach math out in California with all those hippies, but uh, where Carl's is from. <laughs> but uh, no, in any case, so Carl's has a good question. He, he used two words: mo- motivation, or excuse me, momentum and motivation. And I, I, I think momentum, we kind of toss out. I mean, they, they both got here undefeated. They both struggled Saturday a little bit. I mean, Michigan almost lost right to Illinois. Uh, Ohio state didn't get control at Maryland until late. I mean, they were only up three in the fourth quarter. So they, you know, I don't know if we're going to talk about momentum and, and how that really matters. But I'm, I'm with you. I, I think about motivation in terms of who has more to lose. I think, Jim Harbaugh, and I'm curious what you think about this. I think Jim Harbaugh is playing with house money just a little bit. I mean, obviously, he's motivated to win. The fan base wants him to win. He's going to have another shot at a college football playoff and maybe compete a little bit better, have a little bit better showing if he gets there. So that that's clearly um, very, very motivating. But 
what Ryan Day, you know, the prospect is starting off one and two, you know, his career against Michigan as, as a head coach at Ohio State. And not just your point about listening to this all last year, but I, I think I just think that is um, is eating at them in a little bit more fundamental way. And I think that's partly why they've been so dominant in the rivalry. Yes, they've had better talent almost every year. But, uh, you know, you talk to Buckeyes fans and you talk to Ohioans, and we have some in our newsroom who are from there who spend a fair amount of time in Michigan, and they fairly quickly learn that, it, it you know, it, it's hard to judge this completely, but they, it means a little bit more or has in the past to Ohio State, right, than, than, than to Michigan. And, um, and I think that's changed now, right? I mean, the way Harbaugh is putting in uh, – a little bit of practice time each week all year long and that kind of thing. But I'm curious, um, do you think the Ryan Day factor and what he might face and knowing the history of the coaches there, that if you get on the wrong side of that Michigan rival, you're in trouble in a hurry. You are. You are. That is that is what can, uh, can and has spelled trouble for coaches there in the past, although Ohio State has not lost consecutive games against Michigan this century. The last time was 99-2000 when Michigan won two in a row. So – it's been quite some time since anybody's been in trouble in this rivalry over on that side. Um, and really, I mean, if you think about where this was just 365 days ago, the idea that you could be talking about, should things go wrong, Ryan Day is the one on the short end of the stick and Jim Harbaugh has all the momentum. I mean, you couldn't even fathom that in, in 2020 when, uh, when there were questions if he was going to keep his job or even after last year when he was, he was uh, flirting with the, with the Minnesota Vikings. And so, um, certainly, I think uh, Michigan is playing with house money, to, to use your phrase. But then again, if Michigan is um, what Michigan thinks it is and has, frankly, been over the last two years, which is dominant, 2023-2 uh, and two in the last 25, steamrolling everybody who's not Ohio State. And even last year, they did steamroll Ohio State. We'll see what happens, of course, this season. But it's not – I mean, I think it was, it was Ryan Hayes who said it best. He said, if we lose this game – Everything we've done to this point really doesn't mean much, right? It's true. Because the college football playoff likely out, the Big Ten East obviously out, the Big Ten title obviously out, and it's a great season. It's a very actually. Let me walk that back. It's a very good season, a very very good season, and um and you have to. How is be that? Wait, wait, wait. How is that not a great season? Even if they lose, I mean, they're you have, being in this position because no, I know, and it's tough because really that should be a compliment to Michigan fans, yeah. Because there are only X amount of programs who could or should have this standard, right? Michigan had one good win, Penn State. Short of that, there's nothing impressive that they've done. And, that, and that's why. It's not 11-0. 11-0 is tough to do no matter who you're playing. And kudos for, for that. But when you have three that's just obvious walk-in games in the non-conference and eight, not seven, but eight home games instead of, instead of seven, I mean, they've gone on the road three times this year, right? And, um, and, and one of them, they were trailing at Rutgers. And one, they were – in a dogfight at Indiana. And so when the end, they got off on the right side of the foot against Iowa, but it got a little close there in the fourth. So they just have not had that adversity comes on the road and there's no, there's no adversity like the, like the horseshoe in November. Right. And so it's just, yeah, I think Michigan is playing with house money, but should they lose again, then Harbaugh has one win in eight years against Ohio state. And that's, that's still tough. I want to ask Carl's this because this is this is part of Carl's area of expertise, not necessarily college football, but just this idea of of pressure and what coaches should face. I mean, and Carl's, what do you think about the idea? I mean, I know it's crazy to say of all the the winning Ryan Day has done, but if he starts off one and two, he will le- feel legitimate heat, which is crazy to say, but he will feel legitimate heat down there. Where let's just put it this way: what what did Harbaugh start off in this rivalry, Tony? Zero and six. Uh, yeah. uh, because the COVID, the COVID year always throws me off a little bit with his tenure. But so, oh, can you imagine Carlos, a, a, a Ohio State coach, starting off zero and six against Michigan and still not really feeling a whole lot of pressure? There's some disgruntlement there or whatever. It was zero and five. Zero and five. Zero and five. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine that, Carlos? And, and what do you think of that? I'm curious what you think of just how this all works. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know the he starts off Ryan Day starts off one and two and. You know, hopefully Jim Harbaugh brings a third base to the press conference and kind of like shows it <laughs> off and puts Ryan Ryan Day's face on it. Um, yeah, that's uh, you can't. I, I think you know. Let's just be honest. I think that football at Ohio State is different than it is at Michigan. I think. I think it means just a, so much more at that school. 
you know, part of it is the, the, the city that it is, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, I don't know what you would call it. Like not, uh, doesn't have that sort of major city feel, you know, they don't have a bunch of sports teams nearby. They don't have a, you know, it's, it's not quite the same. I don't know what you would call it. There's more provincial, uh, more of a provincial mentality to that. And I think everybody lives and dies with what the bucks do in football. I mean, it just means so much more to that community. I think than, than even Michigan does. Um, not to say that it doesn't mean a lot to Michigan. Um, but I think you're just judged a lot more harshly, you know, there for that. You're, you're that game, you know, and I don't think, I mean, they, because they don't have another right. Well, Michigan's got Michigan state and they've got Ohio state every year. Right. And especially with the way that this program has gone, I mean, you know, Harbaugh was brought in to, to, to bring it back. Right. And, resurrected um and he's done that to varying degrees um i just don't think that i mean this game even if they lose this game while it will be a disappointment in totality if you're a michigan fan you look at what harbaugh has done the last two years how much that program has ascended yeah it'd be very disappointing to not be in the college football playoff to not be playing for the big 10 title all that stuff for sure um, but just you look at it and that this program is going in the right direction, Ohio state, they're just expected, right. To be in that college football playoff every year, especially with the talent that they have with CJ Stroud, probably going to win the Heisman or very close to it, all that stuff. You know, there's just, it's just a different, I think, expectation there. So, um, and Michigan will still be in a, a bowl game. They'll still, you know, all these different things, you know, the Blake Corum thing, the JJ McCarthy, all that there, there's been so many signs of improvement for this team. Um, it won't feel great. I think, I think that's why Tony, you tell me if this is right. I mean, Sean, you wrote a column about it, but when they escaped, you know, on Jake Moody's foot against Illinois at home, right. That would have been a monstrous, just, and I know Coram was hurt from, for pretty much the whole second half. It wasn't in the game and all the, all the other injuries. And, but that would have been such a deflating loss to lose at home. It would have been, oh, you guys were looking to head to Ohio State already, blah, blah, blah. There have been so many questions about that team. That's why it seemed like he was so happy. Harbaugh was so elated that we pulled one out. We saved our season. Because in my in my opinion, when Michigan and Michigan State or Ohio State play, in most seasons, I think, the majority of them, it's kind of a toss-up. You know, I mean, those are two elite programs most years. It's it's kind of a toss up. Yeah, it's gone Ohio State's way recently, but nobody's shocked if one team beats the other, really. Um, and I think Harbaugh kind of knows that getting to this game undefeated is really that step that you need to take, you know, and and you lose the game, whatever. There's a lot of injuries. It's at the horseshoe, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's I, what are they seven point underdogs or something? Right. Um, so it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be the biggest shock in the world. I think Michigan's done so much this year dovetailing or on the, on the back of last year. I think you have to be, you have to be happy as a Wolverines fan, no matter what happens on Saturday. I like that positive outlook and Tony, I want you to answer that, but we need to, um, we need to take a quick break so you can answer it. When we come back, you can also tell us and tell the listeners who you think is going to win this game, but uh, we need to pay a few bills first and we will be right back with more free press sports with Carlson, Sean. Welcome back to Free Press Sports with Carlos and Sean. Uh, you set up a good question there, Carlos. Uh, we should let Tony have at it. What do you think, Car- uh, Tony, if you remember the question? <laughs> yeah. No, it felt like one of my questions at, uh, at a press conference, a little long, long-winded, <laughs> and, I'm, and I was trying to find my way there as I got there. But I think the plane eventually landed. Um, I think it was along the lines of whether, uh, like, would it be surprising one way or the other in this game um, and, and, and has it been lately? I think maybe it hasn't been surprising because it has been so consistently Ohio State. And I don't know, I might have to disagree a little bit with you, Carlos, because last year I was sho- not shocked at the result. I saw a pathway for a Michigan win, but just how, how dominant it was. I mean, there was really yeah. no question. Oh, who that was is better. shocking, of course. Yeah, like who, who was better for, from, I mean, from the kickoff, right? And just sort of imposed their will. And that's not something we'd seen Michigan do on Ohio State since 2011 and I don't know if it was even imposing their will that year it was just uh sort of sort of outlasting in in a year Ohio State was not a good team the last time Ohio State was not a good team um but I would be given the health of Michigan right now 
I would be surprised if if Michigan is, is finds a way to win this game. And I was not saying that Saturday at, at noon. I wasn't even saying it Saturday at 1 p.m. But Saturday, about 1.30, once Blake Corum was not full health, I was like, you know, this might be a problem. But all teams are bigger than one player. But then when you see 18 rushes for 40 yards – from the backups, the and yes, I know they don't have Donovan Edwards either, but they had their pretty much their full complement of, of offensive linemen, which is going to be a Joe Moore Award finalist. Um, I mean, the, the line is fantastic. There's no doubt about it. But I just Sean Sean almost made me feel bad when we were doing our post game video, right? Like I'm like I'm being too hard on, on on JJ McCarthy. I just and and it's so hard because it's so easy to be a prisoner of the moment and like and just be like, no, nah, he doesn't have it. But all the raw talent is there, right? And because he is just, he is so talented. He can, he has this escapability. Um, he's got, he's got a strong arm. I mean, the, the coaches, the players, everyone loves him. He just, he's a good guy to be around, right? I mean, like he, he seems, he seems thoughtful. He gives great responses and like he's this pretty blonde kid and who's five star and he could be arrogant. He could be the whole thing. He's just a good dude, right? And so it's so easy to believe in him. But eventually I have to believe what my eyes show me and maybe, maybe it changes next year. J.J. McCarthy in this passing game are not going to get it done this year. They're just not. Um, I've, I've seen enough to know that. And without a, a, a running game that you can absolutely rely on, which you need more than a 50% Blake Corum to do, I, I, don't, see, I don't see the path. Um, the, yes, they're big, they might be as big or stronger than, than Ohio State. We, to bring it full circle to where we started, Ohio State has that hunger. Um, it's... It's the day in Columbus. They, Michigan hasn't been there in four years. They've had to hear all the different and, – and this happens in the Michigan-Michigan state rivalry when a team has won two years in a row or whatever. It's been a 1,000 days since this team beat that team. <laughs> well, you've played one time. So, yeah, it's a 1,000 days have passed, but you've won one time. So I don't know what we're doing here. But it's just they've had to do it for so long. And last year, Michigan was exercising all of those demons – I think Ohio State um, comes comes out on the on the on the right end of this side, uh, on the right end of this one. I don't know about a number yet, but I think Ohio Ohio State by maybe seven ten. Carlos, yeah, I think that that that's that's where I have it as well. I think um, I, I want the uh, I want the listener to uh, pay his uh, whatever we're charging for the free press these days to to pick up a copy to see our, our predictions, but it's in the same ballpark, um, you know. And that's that's to me the the thing that's been a little surprising is that McCarthy hasn't taken that next step, you know, and really kind of uh, made the difference, you know, taking over when he's needed. And I know they relied obviously on the run game a lot. Um, but just especially against Illinois, you know, I know it was, I know there was some the wind and all this different stuff. It just uh, it just didn't hasn't looked accurate, you know. It just hasn't looked settled when he's out of the pocket and um, hasn't looked as maybe dynamic. Obviously, early in the season they were playing easier teams, but but I would have thought by now with all that experience, with all the reps, with whatever, whatever he would have been, he would have taken maybe a bigger step at this point and been able to say, you know, hey the offense is on me here. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, you know, run to daylight. I'm going to, I don't know if they're not designing enough. The, the offense looked kind of, uh, un- I think you used the word maybe Tony unimaginative uh, a, a little bit, you know, um, forcing things weren't there. And I know they're shorthanded and the, all that stuff, but um, it just didn't, there was something about it. It just doesn't, didn't say, well, I know Illinois has a really good defense, but I just thought there, this game should not have been that close. It should not have come down to Jake Moody, you know, at the end there. And, and um, that's one, that's one weapon that the, that the Wolverines have. And you never know. And I think, I think because we are picking a, a fairly close game, a, a one, maybe a two score game, um, things can happen, right? I mean, turnovers, weird stuff, uh, weather, uh, whatever it might be. And, and, you know, with Jake Moody, Moody's a weapon, you know, he's, he's a difference maker for the Wolverines. Things, things may happen um, in this game. I wouldn't be shocked if Michigan wins. I don't think, but I think the thing is, uh, what do you, what's more likely, um, an Ohio State blowout or a Michigan blowout? I don't see anybody predicting a Michigan blowout. You know, Ohio State, that good, the game could get out of hand and they could win by a lot. I just don't see the game script for a Michigan blowout. They sort of, right. they methodically just 
plod plod their way through the game and they really when they on they've had won many lopsided games it always comes in the second half when they just wear teams down I don't see that happening to Ohio State and all these offenses they're playing um, Rutgers Indiana Michigan State prior to the Illinois scare have nothing near the firepower that Ohio State does I mean Ohio State can score you saw we saw it against Penn State right they're down what four or five I, I'm I'm getting ready to walk into the Michigan Michigan State game I'm stopping by a buddy's tailgate not indulging of course and uh, just saying hi to some friends. And the, the TV goes out. This is not a made-up story. It goes out for maybe five minutes. They're trying to get it plugged back in. It's back on. And Ohio State's up by two scores. Yeah. I'm like, like, it was like we were in a time warp or something. Like, there was not even enough time to get up by that much. So just because they can do it that quickly, I don't see a Michigan blowout. I could understand a Michigan win. That's not what I'm picking. But one last thing uh, that I think I, I should have done a better job mentioning is Michigan had the number one rushing defense, and I think maybe is number two now statistically in, in the country, um, entering last week. And Chase Brown sort of exposed them, right? And Chase Brown is a phenomenal running back. Ohio State can run the ball too. I know they don't need to when they pass it as well as they do, but they can. Uh, and so I just wonder, uh, last year Ohio State really couldn't – Michigan controlled terms on the ground with Hassan Haskins. And that's really – I mean, it's such a cliché. Uh, that's what happens in these games. Whoever dictates the, the ground game really dictates the game. But I think Ohio State can sort of hang there and clearly has the passing passing advantage, wouldn't you say, Sean? Well, yeah, absolutely. They do. They, I mean, they, just, it, it, they have better receivers. I mean, right? The, the, the quarterback is better. But the biggest thing to me is they have better receivers. And, and I'm going to push back on, on, a, on a few things here, gently. One is that um, there are plenty of teams where they're not bigger than a single player. I mean, that's just, that's sports. The idea of next man up is good for us and narrative and all that, but it's, but it's, it's hogwash. Those guys playing ahead of them are there for a reason, right? If you lose your best player, it's really, really hard to overcome that. And it's, even in football, where there are 22 people out there, if you lose your quarterback, right? And if you walk the third. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Michigan State lost. Exactly. It, it, that's a great example. I mean, and, and they're all over the place. Michigan is missing its best. Uh, receiver in schoolmaker it's missing its best contested catch maker in Blake uh, excuse me Donovan Edwards and its best overall player offensively anyway in Blake in Blake Corm and its best def- defensive player at least most important up front in Mike Morris and you saw they had no pass rush at all against Illinois not only that you take the well very f- quickly we don't schoonmaker and Morris did dress last week no no I'm I saying believe- that, no no I'm not saying they'll miss them this Saturday it's saying right, what, right. What, what, off the Illinois game Yep. Then okay. you take in the fact that they, you're right, they've got an NFL level running back and they've got NFL cornerbacks. I think, I, yep. I think one of them was down. So those are by far the best defensive backs they'd seen. I think I'm with you on McCar- uh, McCarthy. He's got, you know, he's not where he hopes he will be, where the staff hopes he'll be, obviously. But he also threw a pass to Andrew Anthony, who was a 45, 50 yarder, that, you know, Anthony's just not capable of making those contested catches. And nobody on that team is other than Edwards or Schoonmaker. And so Which if he is makes an indictment entirely on it, it, no, before. that's absolutely true. If he makes that catch, all of a sudden, his st- how different do his stats look, right? First of all, that's a yeah. touchdown, and then the game shifts completely differently from there. But that's how that's how to me, it's also not, I don't want to say indictment that's so harsh with college kids, but oh my god, just well, let's, let's say, let's they say are a, semi professional professionals, of NIL. no, they're, they're not, not college no, kids. I mean, they're getting paid, you're right, 25. Come on, no, 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 but let's say that about Harbaugh. The it's depth, an indictment, sure. the depth's not there, Tony, and that's on Harbaugh, right? I mean, this is a really, really good team, but the depth's not there, and the receiving core is how many, how many teams have that kind of depth. Four? But there's no, I mean, the thing is, there's they're no playing excuse. a team against that kind of depth, right? That's what they're going yes, up against. Yes. But and that's Ohio the key. Ohio State is, is wide receiver you. And, well, not just, but right they've now, got, yeah. yeah. And they're trying, and that's what they're chasing, though. They're chasing Georgia loses 11, what, 12? Oh, no, no, not eight, nine draft picks on defense and another four or five on offense. I think 15 NFL guys. And they're almost, or maybe as dominant as ever, right? Yep. Just plug the guys in. It's not, it's not a bunch of freshmen. I mean, there are probably a, a few freshmen, but uh, so so Michigan's just not in that spot, and and I think that's what we saw against Illinois. And if those guys aren't healthy, I'm with you, man. They don't. I don't think they have a chance. Actually, those are four critical, critical players. You know right. what I and mean? And that's why I wish. 
I mean, you just wish that we had a little more sense, right, of, of knowing who was even going to be available. And I think, I think it was us who we were talking about it, Sean, or maybe it was, it was with Reiner when we were at the press conference with, with Jim Harbaugh the other day. When you think about the gambling lines and the money and this and the NIL and everything, I mean, I know, I know it's not, it sounds funny when you're talking about it with, uh, with college, but like when you think about the stakes of this game and just all the different ramifications and layers to it, College has to get to the point where there there needs to be um, an injury report, like the <laughs> like the NFL. I really yeah. I really think it does. It's just yeah. I mean, how are we even supposed to like? Maybe this is a silly conversation. Maybe it's not. This is what we do for a living. So I would like to say that it's not. But how are we even supposed to have a fully educated uh, conversation on what's going to happen, other than just well, if this or if that, without knowing like well, like. They were limited in practice. At least that's some information. We don't even get, like, when we're all at, at, at the Lions together, the 15, 20 minutes you can see individual walkthrough. We don't get to go to practice. We don't get an injury report. I mean, we're reading tea leaves out here. I, I would like to congratulate, take this moment to congratulate Tony Garcia on becoming a full-fledged Michigan beat writer now that he's bitching about the access at <laughs> Schembechler Hall and the lack of it. We don't get to see any practices and, you know, yeah. Yeah. So congratulations, Tony. You've, you've made it. You get, a, I think you get an honorary smoking jacket. Gold star. Yeah. Yeah. No. Hey, yeah. so, so here's here. Let me ask you this. Uh, first I want, well, we can't end this by the way, before letting Sean off the hook, he has to give us his prediction, but Correct. Before that happens, I do I do want to posit this. It's just what about if if Michigan wins this game, okay? If they win this game, they go down to the horseshoe in whatever it was, 1,200 days or whatever we're counting, and two straight, he hands, you know, Ryan Day third base, all this stuff, right? He does all these things. He does it with a, with a different quarterback than he did it with last, you know, he's made that switch. Does he not? Does this not go down as maybe the two greatest victories over Ohio State that Michigan a a, a, a beat down last year at the Big House and then going down to Ohio State and be, I mean if they if he pulls us off with two different quarterbacks you know of his doing his his decision it would I I think it would certainly be up there it was fair and so um, hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'll get. I'll give this away. A little nugget. Sort of. We'll plug the the ninety seven. The ninety seven win with Charles Woodson. That was a really good Buckeye team that set up the national championship. That's probably number one. Right. I think. And and anything that leads to that sort of season, um, I think certainly gets gets the. Oh, well, um, you had a superstar, a of a, a future Hall of Fame player on your team, which Michigan does not have a Hall of Fame NFL player on their team right now. Or even last year. Nor, yeah, or nor did they last year. No, it's 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 a good point. Um, Don't say Aiden I Hutchinson. Just, I know but, you want to say Aiden Hutchinson, John, or uh, Sean, but no. No, I'm not going to say it, but wouldn't that be funny? If that oh. Ends up happening? You're the one talking about how good he is. Okay. All right. Sorry, Tony. Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. Uh, Aiden has been great um, the, the last the last few weeks. It's really been refreshing to see. Um but, I mean, I think just to do it back-to-back, back, um, it really, last year, with how bleak things looked going into 21, there was not no real reason for optimism for a 12-1 uh, season before 12-2 and in the playoff. And then to run it again 11-0 next year, um, two years ago today, imagine the odds you could have gotten on that. So in that, in that lens, absolutely. And just given the magnitude of this game, I mean, this is a... This is as big as a game can possibly be in the college football regular season, right? Uh, with all the stakes, the most famous rivalry, the last week of the year. Uh, I mean, it's, it's perfect. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's theater. And uh, we can only hope that it lives up uh, to, to the billing that it has. Um, there, I'm going to have a story coming out later. Uh, just uh, I sat down with Lloyd Carr before the Illinois game, just 20, 20 minutes or so, uh, talking a little bit about that 2006 game. I uh, just wanted to pick his brain, what he thought, and you could feel it. I mean, I, before his words came out of his mouth, you could see it in his eyes. He's still not over that one. And I asked him, I said, was, I was like, was this the toughest loss that you've had? And he's like, well, none of the losses were easy, but, but he said, he said enough. And uh, you could tell he's, he just, you don't, you don't forget that one. And this is an opportunity for Jim Harbaugh, for Michigan, for this season to mean something forever. Um, Last year was, last year was great. And I think, it does mean something forever in the sense of how it reshifted Michigan back to thinking and being what Michigan likes to think of itself uh, or, or, or the, the lore that they believe they are in. And last year they were, and this year they are just the 
the level in which they're playing at. This win, it's hard to overstate what it would do. Frankly, I don't. I don't think. I don't think you can overstate it. I think Tony's just talked himself into us uh, doing another free press book about this season. So, well, um, if they if they win, alert Kirkland Crawford, if they keep winning, we probably will. You know, you know what's interesting. You're, you're right. It's a huge game. It doesn't. And and I have no way to. This is just a feeling. There's no way to 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 prove this. Uh, it's just one of those sort of objective. Or excuse me, subjective opinions. But it doesn't quite feel as big as 2006 and i and i've thought a lot about this the last few days and i think part of the reason is that in 2006 first of all they were one and two as opposed to two and three and i think the college football world a lot of it not everybody but a lot of the college football world thought they were the best two teams in the country and that's not the case now right and and that's different and this was back when the big 10 hadn't completely exposed itself as it has over the last 15, 16, 17 years on a national level. And then, of course, but that game ended up doing some of that because Ohio State won, obviously, and then got just beat down by Florida in the title game. And Michigan went out in the Rose Bowl and got spanked by USC. USC. And there was a there was a speed differential. I remember the, uh, you know, re, you know, rest in peace, the great Drew Sharp. And I talking about it even way back then, just the, the, the idea of the SEC and the, the regional differences in the speed and the athleticism and all that. And I just think that still lingers a little bit, even though Ohio State has won a title with Urban Meyer and beat, beat Alabama on the way to do it. Uh, a while, it was that 2014, maybe 15? I can't remember what First year. year in the playoff. Yeah, 14 maybe. Um, I think that's, that's maybe what I'm feeling a little bit, Tony. It's just 2006 just felt a little more monumental because of that. <laughs> because and, we didn't know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I know. And I know that's sort of silly to say, but no, that's it's fair. It, it just, that's just, I, I don't know what y'all think of that. I'm curious if y'all feel that or sense that or that feels you know, fair. It, but, but I think this year, all full health across the board, right? I would have Ohio State and Michigan as my two and three. I think, I think right now where they're all ranked, I think those are, the, I think they are two of the best. Full health. I, I would agree with that. This, the, problem is, the problem is Georgia, right? Yeah. Is Georgia on such another level that two and three is really just playing for silver? Um, uh, that that was, could be an argument. But I was talking to uh, another former, uh, another former, well, I shouldn't say it that way. Let me say a, a former uh, free press writer and Joe Rexrode, who was a couple of, he's, he was actually in town for Michigan State, Villanova. His son goes up to Michigan State and he was talking about Georgia because he, he saw him up close against Tennessee. He's like, man, it's just a different, it's a different level. And uh, you think they're going to be a little bit down this year because of all that talent they lost, and they're right back there. And um, so, so, so we'll see. We're getting way ahead of ourselves, you know. I mean, Michigan's got a monumental test to even get a shot at that. But uh, I, I was just curious if y'all sensed uh, what's your sense of the hype and the and the feeling of this game, it's especially you, Carlos. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely not nobody saying, you know, I think we're we're all talking about, you know, whoever wins this game is probably going to win the Big Ten title and obviously get into the CFP and all that stuff. Um, but nobody's saying they're the presumptive national champion, whoever comes out of this game. Um, you know, they both got some issues with health and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the SEC. I mean, that's a it's a semi pro league, really, at this point. Um so you have to you have to go through an SEC team almost every year, right, to win the to win the title. So of course, you know, I'm saying all that, and TCU is going to win the title. So we'll uh, <laughs> well, I'm rooting for the Horn Frogs. Will I'm not sorry, be winning the title. <laughs> I would oh, I would love that so much. I would love TCU to win. Yeah, not me. That goes against my uh, belief. Uh, it's a private <laughs> it's a private school, man. You uh, want you want big yeah yeah. I yeah, want public know. schools. I want schools that you are, want just uh, a nice small humble university like Michigan or Ohio State. No, to, just to underdogs mean, in this whole thing. No, not necessarily that. Ohio State's more accessible than Michigan, but I want uh yeah, <laughs> I want I want uh I'm a public school guy. You know, it's just you know, I'm old fashioned that way. Sorry. You no, know how it that's goes. Fa- that's that's fair, but as far as George, I mean jo- yes, George is Georgia, but Things happen. Alabama was Alabama until until they lost a couple times yeah. this year, right? Yeah, and, no, uh, no, you're no, you're absolutely right. No, you're absolutely right. And um, and we'll, and we'll see what happens. I'm with you. I need to give a because we, we got to take another break here, but I need to give a pick. So yeah, I'm I'm with, I'm with y'all. I think Ohio State's going to win. I think between uh, probably by at least ten, uh, and I'm basing that on the health. You know, it, like I said, I'm with you, Tony. If I knew if they were fully healthy, it, I would. I would say Ohio State by three, 
right? I mean, it was basically a toss up, and you'd pick Ohio State because they're home. But uh, wow. but not knowing what the health, I just right. Yeah, I was going to pick. I mean, it's not just the health; it's how they looked after the health too. With just, I mean, not not just surviving Illinois. They didn't look good, really, in any phase of the game. I mean, they weren't getting pressure on the quarterback. They weren't stopping the run. They weren't passing the ball. They weren't running the ball. They really just. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how they scraped three field goal drives together in a row just to. to oh, to Mac- get Mac- I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I hate I hate to say this, McCarthy, right? Yeah. I mean, the 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 ball that he one. the ball he dropped and scrambled out. He's actually. He's he's almost better on the run sometimes throwing than he is uh he is in the pocket because he's what is he six he feet can't one? put so much six three much on he's six three him. he's not six three Tony you stood three. next to him man uh, I have stood next to him uh six th- I I don't know I wouldn't I he's, wouldn't go he's no. listed as six three so well he's means, not he, he's he's shorter than one and a half yeah I, that's exactly six right. one and a half right, that so, even that's generous so if Blake Corum's listed as five he does eight, walk around five, five? Beckler Hall in bare feet so he doesn't get like any extra height which no he, you're right he's you're, ask him. you're right I remember the first time I saw him and you're right he was in bare feet I'm like wow is he even six feet tall but but uh, you're right the shoe the shoes you know they give you a little bit of height so we're recording this on a Tuesday I'm literally about to go talk to him in we are all are in uh, the the media in about an hour and a half, and I'll see if I can ask him why he wear, doesn't wear shoes. Well, maybe That's, it's just part of the free flowing, uh, carefree kind of person that uh, he he and, wants to be. Seems to and be. I, I could see that being grounded. I mean, like he he meditates on the field before the game. Maybe there's a. I mean, I would I wouldn't put anything past him. And he's undefeated as a starter. So I mean, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it right now. <laughs> you want it, you want your feet to feel the you want your feet to feel the earth. And real quickly, um. I, I think he needs, like any quarterback, uh, guys that can make contested catches and get separation, which is guys that did, did neither against Illinois, right? So, and, and the only and, one who I could even see being the one to do that is Ronnie Bell, right? Yeah, Will, Roman yeah. Wilson is just too much of a gadget. Uh, I, I, I don't know what Cornelius Johnson – I mean, he's a big body receiver, but he's not great at high-pointing it. I don't know how strong his hands are or from what we've seen. Andrell, I think, is a little bit in his head right now. And that's four receivers. Like beyond that, you're not that much deeper than that. You got Tyler Morris, who's flashed a little bit here and there. AJ Henning was hurt last week, and he's pretty much out of the receiver rotation entirely, just a specialist. So it's the, Schoonmaker the and Edwards. The receiving that's right. pores is the biggest difference. Yeah, no, teams. Schoonmaker and Edwards are the two best players, uh, playmakers in the passing game, along with Ronnie Bell. And yeah, without those two guys, I, I'm with you. I don't see a chance. So. In any case, thanks for joining us, Tony. Uh, we we got to let you go. You got to get over to Schembechler Hall and keep up the great reporting. Carlos is grateful that uh, you joined us on sh- such short notice. We I'm will always thankful to to get to talk to you guys. Yeah, I don't it, see Carlos nearly enough anymore. At least we still get to hang out. Yeah, um, no, no, no. You'll you'll get to see you'll get to see Carlos soon. You're gonna. Sean, be, Sean doesn't let me. He wants to, he he wants to hug all the glory. So. He wants all the big games. Sorry, no, sure. no. Carlos is just waiting until Michigan goes to the playoff, and then I'm sure we'll see him in Indy at St. Elmo. Yeah, yeah. No national. I'm waiting for the national title game. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like another colleague. Yeah, that's great. Listen, <laughs> uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's this will be Sean's it. last podcast. Yeah, it, it will be after that. Let's take uh, let's take one more quick break, and we'll be right back with more free press sports with Carlos and Sean. Hello. I'm Phil Friend, the host and producer of Spartan Speak, a podcast collaboration between the Detroit Free Press and Lansing State Journal focusing on Michigan State sports. Each week, I'm joined by the OGs of the MSU podcasting game, freak beat writer Chris Slaurie and LSJ sports columnist Graham Couch, as we discuss and dissect the latest sports news coming out of East Lansing. Not only is Spartan Speak one of, if not the longest-running MSU sports podcast out there, you won't find a show with two people as clued into the Spartans as Chris and Graham, each of whom have spent a decade-plus covering MSU and bring years of institutional knowledge and insight to the podcast. And once in a while, they'll let me throw out a take as well. Along with discussing the latest news, we'll break down the Spartans' last game on the hardwood and the gridiron. What went right? What went wrong? Jet sweep. Again? For both Mel Tucker and Tom Izzo, get you ready for the next game, make predictions, and so much more. We can also guarantee at least one reference to Kalamazoo every podcast. So if you haven't already, download, subscribe, and listen to Spartan Speak on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or on your podcast app of choice. Welcome back to Free Press Sports with Carlson and Sean. Carlos, um, we kind of buried the lead with this podcast. I know you think it's all about Michigan and Ohio State, but it, it really is about the four and six Lions. And have you in your life ever seen a fan base get so 
I, I don't want to say excited because that's maybe not quite it, but just worked up over uh, a few wins over sub 500 team. Well, not the Giants, I guess, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Have you ever, you ever seen anything like this? It's a 4 and 16, man. And people are going crazy Sunday when they beat New York. I, I haven't seen it in, in full disclosure for our listener out there. Um, when you say the fan base, you're talking about yourself because uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. And, and Sean called me yesterday, or I don't know what it was today, yesterday, really excited about this, the prospect of a potential playoff run for the Lions. And he's all in. I'm pretty sure he's got some Honolulu blue pajamas, a onesie, probably. No, I don't um, think they're going to make the playoffs. No, on. but you're excited at the prospect because you want more than anything winning teams that you get to cover that play meaningful games. And you get to go playoff runs on hotels on the. No, it has nothing to do with hotels. You want want glory. You're a glory chaser. No, it's not glory at all. It's business. My goodness, man. Readers read more when the teams are winning. And, and, you know, I can't believe you're this out of touch with our community. I don't know if you've noticed, but our teams, uh, the the teams that are in the state we live in, have not been good for a good long while. And, um, you know, so it'd be nice to do something. I know you're excited. You're excited about it. No, I think uh, I think Thursday at Ford Field, if they're competitive at all, is going to be a great atmosphere. And if you don't like that, then what are you doing? Why are you doing this job? Well, even even well, I'm doing this job. I mean, I cover the lines for a long time, and it's just to cover you know a, a yearly funeral, really. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, but what it's, pleasure? What pleasure do you get out of it? I'm not talking about you, the. I'm a, I'm a professional. I don't have to get pleasure out of my job. I do my job, and I go home and I sleep well. You no, know? you you. I'm sure you could have done other things. You know, right? Yeah ditch digging maybe but yeah right um, i mean you got to enjoy your work i mean isn't that what you tell your kids you send you you send your kids off to school and tell them uh uh it doesn't matter what you study you just need to go make a paycheck is that what yes. you, was that your message to them that's my message just uh grind it out be unhappy okay. and yeah okay just do, do okay. your job and shut up yeah i'm sure that was your message yeah <laughs> the hypocrisy is just so uh <laughs> now, just, you know what though here's the really thing something. is, is it, it is true that people get way more and hey Credit to the Lions fans, even through this, even before this winning streak, they were showing up to Ford Field and they were vocal. You know, you and I were there um, and they've stuck with this team, you know, this season. Um, and it's going to be, they're, they're going to show out. They're going to show up and show out for that game on Thanksgiving. Um, they're, they, the Lions deserve that support for what they've done. You know, beating the two bad teams, um, beating a, a decent team, but overrated Giants team on the road, first road win for, and that was the, no, that was the Chicago bears, but the first winning streak uh, of Dan Campbell's career, um, you know, and the, the, the great thing, which we're going to get into, I'm sure is just how, what was it three weeks ago? We we're talking, Burkett asked the question of Brad Holmes, like, can you fire Brad, Dan or can yeah, he fire you? I know. I and know, now we have, been, you know, your favorite coach been. with the NHL Red, Red Wings, Derek Lalonde, saying uh, he wants to bring Campbell in to talk to his players and motivate them. Unfortunately, he called the team powder blue, not Honolulu blue. So we got some work there. But but yeah, now Dan Campbell is going to be on a celebrity, you know, chicken dinner, luncheon speaking, you know, circuit. Oh, my God, dude. If they, if they start winning big. It's not going to happen. Don't even say no, that. I'm not, I'm not saying this big. year. I'm saying if they ever start winning big with this staff, with this coach. What's going to happen with Campbell? Let's just say they get. Well, I mean, don't name the state of Mass. Suspend your disbelief and, and, and say they get to a Super Bowl and, my goodness, win it with Campbell as the coach. And I'm not no, thinking, saying no. this. Gonna, what would happen to him? No. What would happen? I mean, they they would just, you know, encase his body in gold and erect him as I mean, a statue would he, on Woodward would, Avenue. Yeah, and, and, and would he even need to coach or would he just go around the country making motivational speaches? <laughs> right. I mean, be like, would, like Jim Malvano. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. You know, yeah, that's the thing is that, you know, I, and I I don't want to get into this too much. I know you love writing about coaches and, you know, but the thing with Dan Campbell after observing a lot of Lions coaches is there is something different about him. And I've been very impressed. And this it's not has nothing to do with that stupid, the veneer of the biting the kneecaps and all that stuff. Forget all that garbage. Um We've seen him, we've watched him at press conferences and all this after losses, after tough losses, after, after rare wins, after, you know, and there's a, there's a, a genuineness to him that you don't see in football very often. And it has nothing to do with, he's not, the, the mistake people make is he's some rah, rah, pounding, 
the table guy and they say, you know, yeah, he has emotion, but for the most part, he's a very um, understanding guy who is thoughtful in his answers, thoughtful in what he does, how he handles things. He really is. I think he's a people person um, in a subtle way, you know, like I think we think of him as, ah, he's a dude, you know, he looks like a dude and this and that. And there's some of that, but, but it's mostly that he really seems to have a good sense of his team and his, and his personnel, coaches, staff, players. Um, you get that sense from talking to people on the team and around the team and, and the players themselves. Um, it doesn't have to be an overblown, oh, I'm going to run through a wall for coach Campbell. That's not really what it is. It's this mutual respect of you're not blowing smoke. I, and you're telling it like it is you've been in my shoes as a player. Now you're in a different spot. And you're, you're not lying to me. You're understanding who I am. You're understanding my situation. You know, a really good example of this is Amani Warrior, who had six picks last year. Now he's lost his starting job. You know, he's struggled, but he's been okay with it. The way that Campbell has explained it to him, you know, explaining that you do have a future in this league. You know, I can't guarantee you a starting spot. I can't guarantee you it's going to be here, but, but stick with it. You have talent. You can move on. We'll help you do that. We'll help you keep getting better and, and maybe, you know, finding your way. That's the kind of stuff that people respond to. Um, that's, I think more than anything, what has helped them stay together and keep believing through the close losses, you know, that this is possible watching the little moments of improvement, you know, in different areas. Um, that's what you can look at. Um, it's not that Dan Campbell's some amazing motivator and whatever, you know, it's that the team has stuck with them. They've got a pretty good plan. They just need better personnel. And maybe, yeah, in two, three, four years, maybe they will reach that elite level of being a, a playoff, a, a legitimate, consistent playoff contender. Well, it has to be in conjunction, right, with, with Brad Holmes and identifying talent. I mean, obviously, if you don't have talent, you don't have anything. Yeah. But the reason I... I write about coaches, especially in the football, is because coaches matter probably more in football than any other sport. And um, basketball, yeah, they do. I mean, college basketball, college basketball, they're important. I mean, big in in there's in terms of recruiting, obviously, right? But uh, no, they matter. They matter in every sport. But in football, it just seems like uh, the influence a coach has on a game and the week and the preparation and everything else is just a little bit more outsized. Um, in baseball, I would argue it's probably the least. But, um, but you know, good managers, good managers too. But anyway, I just, it's, it's just interesting in football. It's just the, it's the nature of the sport and the relationship to, uh, to, to one individual who has so much control over how everything looks and plays out and, and is set up and everybody learns. He's leading an stuff. army. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's just really it's general. It's true. And it's just, so it's, it's kind of unique in American sports in that way. But, um, I, I, I completely, um, you, you, it's a, it's a good observation. He's not a, a meathead. That's the, that's the, uh, sort that's of the, the misconception. Yeah. That's the, the misconception. The sound bites. And you, you're right. You can, you can hear it in the way the players talk to him and so on and so forth. I think you can hear it even in the way he is with us. Oh yeah. In news conferences, just little subtle things like, um, say somebody, a couple of people ask, ask a question at the same time. I've seen him several times, you know, whoever, goes first, you know, you went out, you're loudest, whatever that next reporter I've seen him several times point to and say, Hey, you know, you had a question, right? I'll come back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Or I'll come. He, he, and just little human, he, basic, decent things like that. Right. He and, manages, he manages the game in all its totality, the press conferences, the players, the meetings, the, the, the demotions, he handles it. The firings he handles it. Well, he has a good sense for people. He does. That's just great. It's just I don't want to say public relations because that makes it sound like it's uh, not 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 authentic, and that's the part that it, 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 right. He's just, but I mean that in the truest sense of the word. He's good at relating to the public, and 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 to people in general. To your when point. he when he cut Don Muehlbach on his birthday, the long long time long snapper, and he came back the next press conference and called himself an a hole and all this stuff and. He wasn't like it wasn't for show. He meant it. He's like, I'm I'm I did it. I'm an idiot. I, I shouldn't have done this. I should have been aware of that. It was a it was a blind spot that you know he had to do that. And he owned it. And that's been the thing with Campbell when he forgot to his rookie season and forgot to, you know, schedule those joint uh uh, uh um training camp practices. 
because he just wasn't aware of the timeline and it was too late and he missed out. And he's like, he owned it. There, there's very little subterfuge with him. And in fact, when it happens, I'm I'm kind of shocked when he does kind of lean on the coach speak here and there. It, it doesn't happen very often. And when it does, I'm actually surprised because most coaches do. It's just so easy to, to back into that, you know, cliche. Oh, well, we can't, we don't know. We don't get into injuries. He'll tell us before practices. Don't, yeah, you're not going to see this guy here. I don't know. This guy we'll see, you know, you can kind of read between the lines sometimes if, you know, what, what he's saying, but he, he seems like an up and up guy. And I think in, in pro sports, but especially in the NFL, you just don't see it that much from coaches anymore. From well, no, the, yeah. And the other thing I like too, is in the, after they beat the giants in the locker room, you know, the lions released the, a little bit of this, the, the post-game speech. And, and at one point he's telling the guys, you're learning how to do it. You're, you're learning how to win. And he said, he's, this is how he said, he said, you're learning how to win. We're learning how to win. Like the, the staff, yeah. like him, like acknowledging that he is getting better too and figuring things out. And I just, there's a certain humility that goes with that. Yes. And, um, and it's, and it's really real. And I think, I think that matters. And the other thing I would point out real quickly is I, I think his football acumen is not so bad either. Maybe, maybe when we look back mm-hmm. to a year ago, when he let the offensive coordinator go and he took over the play calling, they immediately got better. Oh yeah. So yeah. R- right, and then he finds Ben Johnson, and 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 who's rightly getting a lot of credit for the offense, uh, and and the sequencing and the play and the design and all that, and the, the way he calls things. That's great. But to me, it seems, I bet he's pretty synced up with Campbell. Yeah, in that way, and that's, in that way, right? You know, that's part of the thing, and 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 that's where that's where Campbell has probably had to have the biggest growth. You know, is his coordinators. You know, hiring his lieutenants, having the right people. But he's had he's had the guts to fire Aubrey Pleasant when he felt things weren't going well. You know, we're gonna see what happens with Aaron Glenn. I, I know I know Dan Campbell does not want to be firing people. Nobody does. No coach wants to. It's a really hard thing to do. It's also it's an indictment in your own decision making when you hire them in the first place. You know, but uh, if this defense the defense is playing better, but it's gonna be a hard decision if you bring Aaron Glenn back. You know, if this defense doesn't keep taking strides if it, you know, and they're going to go against some, you know, decent teams here, especially with the bills. That's going to expose the defense probably a little bit more. Um, you know, you, you, you're going to have to be aware of that and you can't, if the defense is, is struggling again next year and you have stuck with Aaron, with Aaron Glenn, that's going to be rough. Um, yeah, that's a big decision coming up in the off season for him, but, but yeah, he wasn't, you know, he took over for, for Anthony Lynn and he wasn't even sure if Ben Johnson was going to call the plays and turns out he's kind of a wunderkind and he can call plays and he's really good at it. And um, just wait till they go through a whole season of knowing who they're going to be. And he's the offensive, you know, play caller and they get a draft that way. Um, that should help make a difference for them to take another step on offense. Um so that that there's a lot of things here that there are things that are trending in the right way. Um, as far as playoffs, like they're right there. There's, I mean, a lot of stuff has to go right for them. Well, well let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Cause let me just set this up for you this way sure. for the playoffs. Do you, what, what is your, your, your gut tell you? What does your, your mind tell you, your brain tell you about the possibility? Because our colleague, uh, Dave Burkett, sort of laid out it was it's funny i mean i'm trying to remember the last time we said oh here's a see a game by game prediction what we do in the middle of the season but it made a lot of it made a lot of sense because people are going nuts right now and um and that was a really good call to do that but he kind of laid out their path and i don't want to tell the listeners what he said i I, I want i want to hear what you think do you think they have a shot at this no they don't have a shot at this it's it's uh you know, the winning streak is commendable, but um, there's, there's just too many roadblocks. There's too many teams ahead of them. Um, you know, what do they have now? Um, before the Bills game, they've got seven games left, right? Um, so they've got to, they've got to get to at least nine wins, you know, um, and they have four. Yeah, five, five and two is the, is the, would give them a, a pretty good shot at it. Uh, six and one uh, would get them in, yeah, but five, five and so, so five and two. So that's really the question. Can they, can they go five and two? Uh, I think they could go four and three, maybe if everything breaks right, but five and two is just a big ask, right? The, the two wins. I mean, Jacksonville playing Jacksonville at home and at Carolina, probably the two most likely wins after that. 
uh, you know, Chicago at home, you know, at, maybe, yeah, okay, uh, at Green Bay, last game of the season, at the Jet, you know, there's just a lot of, it's, there. none of those games are certainties. No, they're games they can win, but they're just as easily games they can lose, right? Yeah. To me, to me, it's it's about this Thursday. So if they somehow ride this momentum and the crowd, the Thanksgiving Day crowd, and the Bills being not quite the juggernaut we thought they would, they they were. Although that could change in a week, right? I mean, who knows? Josh Allen could play his best game of, the, of his career, and that happens sometimes. But if they if they upset the Bills, um, then then it, it to me it changes. Then, then you can go uh, four and two without without Buffalo on the schedule, and that doesn't seem outrageous. But that's a big if on Thursday, right? If you, yeah, I mean, and we're talking nine wins is the minimum, the minimum that they have to get to to get a wild card spot. And they probably, for sure, have to get if they get ten, they're almost certainly in. But minimum nine. Um, so you're talking five and two, but, but, but six and one would be really preferable here. Um, you know, that that's, yeah. If they beat if they beat the bills and I, I, I laid this out in my prediction, um, is just, yeah, the bills, you know, it's kind of a weird week for them, right? There are five, two games in five days in Detroit and Josh Allen's elbows a little bit messed up. You know, he hasn't looked amazing. Um, it's they're not they're not the juggernaut that they were earlier in the season when they were beating the Chiefs and they were you know rolling and whatever. Um, so it's not like it's an, an unwinnable game. The Lions are playing well, um, so it, it could happen. And yeah, if that happens, you're talking four game winning streak, hosting Jacksonville on whatever extra three days rest you know from Thanksgiving break. Um, yeah, I mean, that the, they could win. That's a five game winning streak. And then who knows? I mean, that's that, that, that could change the complexion um, to, to think that this team, that the only thing about this team is they've got, there's just, you know, they don't have a heck of a lot of depth. And you're just talking about that with Michigan, but they just don't have a lot of depth at a lot of spots. You know, the one spot that the one unit is their offensive line that's been very consistent and they've rolled the right guards in and out of there, but they've been very effective, very consistent. The, you know, Jamal Williams has played well, um, but they don't have TJ Hawkinson anymore, you know, and their, their receivers an issue. St. Brown's good, but he's the only dependable threat really um, as a receiver. So there's just a lot of things that um, can, are going to play factors. They, they'd have to have so much, going for them health and probably some luck um, to win five more games. Um, so, but you're right, Sean. I mean, this game could tell us if they, if they, not only if they not, if they win, but if they, if this is a close game, you know, if they yeah, lose right. at the end, if they're ahead and they blow the lead, but they just narrowly lose to the bills. I mean, that that's, that's saying a lot about how, how far the lines have come this season. Well, you, well, you think back to the opening game, I mean, right. Yeah, and, and had had Philly right there. I mean, that's yeah. kind of looking back. Like, Opening oh. games are weird in the NFL. The op- season openers, weird things happen. But yeah, yeah, they they who look at Philly now, right? I mean, right, right. A lot yeah. of their losses actually look pretty good now. Yeah, they do, except for the except for the New England one. But um, but yeah, no, we'll uh, we'll have plenty more time to talk about, and we can get into individual and 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 why they were. Why they're uh, kind of on this win streak? Why you're saying they're trending in the right direction? We can talk about Jared Goff and all sorts of other stuff. We can, we can do that in the coming weeks. But, um, but yeah, the fact that we're even talking about having this conversation is where we were a few weeks ago. <laughs> Three is, weeks ago is is who can fire who? And now it's like no, what, I know what, it's just it's what it's, city are they going to for the playoffs? Yeah, it's really something that it makes. That's what's tricky about our job sometimes, right? Because we want to project. You want to you want to be fair and have things in context. On the other hand, you got to write about what you're seeing right in front of you in the moment. Mm-hmm. Knowing full well it can change, and then you know it's just it's just it's just part of it. So in any case, I think it's time uh, we've been we've been talking way too long. Plus, you got to get to your banana bread. We need to have a a, <laughs> a, a couple of quick my favorite things here, and uh, let the listeners get back to their lives. All right, my favorite thing this week. Um, I, I I really wanted to play the Sean Windsor uh, uh, emotional sappy card and say my kids are home from college for the first time in the same in the house together for the first time since they went away to college. But you don't care about your kids, okay? Well, the it, it, I, I do love them, I care about them, but you know what I care about more about Sean is planning vacations. And uh, I was thinking my wife's got a, a birthday coming up, 
you know, we were talking about vacations and it's, it's in February and it's been so cold here in Michigan, the wind and everything. We've somehow had a pull of vortex out of nowhere. We were starting to kick around the idea of, of a Hawaii vacation. We haven't been there in a really long time and we both loved it. And it just, you know, when it's so cold outside and there's snow and, uh, you know, all this, just the thought of, of dreaming about that Hawaiian, that, 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 that day on the beach and, and hanging out. And if you've ever been, I'm sure you've been to Hawaii many times on the company's dime. Never been. But it's, uh, it's, it's spectacular. Any kind of tropical place like that, right, is amazing. Um, it's just that one, and I, that one little thought in your head that kind of keeps you going. Even if it doesn't happen, just the, you know, pricing flights, looking at hotels, all this different stuff, um, kind of living vicariously that way. Um, that's, that's really what, um, that's, and then, you know, obviously, you know, kids would go with us for sure. But, um, but that, that was my favorite thing. It's just having that, that little fantasy moment of, of thinking of what could be. Well, that sounds nice. So I've, I've never been to Hawaii. In fact, um, it's funny because when Shannon Shelton used to cover the Michigan State Spartans for us. She followed Jamel Hill, if I'm not mistaken. When she decided she was going to uh, leave the paper and and go into a different part of her career, um, it was right before the basketball season started. Some things came up, you know. It's, it's just the way this goes sometimes. And I um, ended up kind of filling in that winter on a really short notice. But it was but Michigan State start, either started their season or after maybe one exhibition or two exhibition games. They had a tournament trip to uh, one of those Thanksgiving trips to Hawaii. Yeah. But when Shannon decided she was leaving, she planned the date so that she could have the Hawaii trip. Oh. So I picked the team up and I had to uh, cover the team as a beat writer from the day they got back from Hawaii. So that was my close. That's the closest I ever got to Hawaii. But I, it, it's all good because <laughs> I ended up on an aircraft carrier and meeting uh, Obama. I think it was. I think it was that season. Maybe. The oh next wow. Season. Yeah, so the no, there, there there was some fun. Sticking with that theme, though, and you know I'm an NBA guy. It's my it's it's what I enjoy. You're a college the, basketball guy, but yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. The NBA is if if I'm not working, that's the thing I, and I don't watch a lot of sports if I'm not working. But but that's the thing that I enjoy the most. If if I have to watch a sport, is the NBA. I like the World Cup too. But um, oh my god. But it's the NBA. But in terms of being in person. You know, I, I, I forget this. I don't know why I forget this. Maybe it's because the college basketball season isn't that long. It's longer than the football season, but the college football season. But uh, Friday night, I was up at Michigan State and I played Villanova. And I just forget sometimes when you're, at a, when you're at a place where the crowd is great, and it's a great one out there at the Breslin Center, the, just how loud it is and where you sit. They're one of the few programs that keeps you down on the court, although that's changing. We uh, reporters used to have both baselines this year starting. You only have one baseline donors got the other. And I'm, sh- and I'm sure as soon as Izzo retires, th- those seats are going to be gone. He's the one that's kept them that way. He's kind of old school that way, but uh, tell them the grandfather you in the Sean Windsor yeah, yeah. baseline. But, seat. uh, but, but I got to sit on the baseline on the court for a great game with all that noise and all that fun. It was a fluke because one of the local TV people didn't show up. So I got it one more chance. So it's kind of the last Probably the last time I'll be on the on the baseline there. Um, we're going to be up on the platform. The seats are fine. It's a great way to cover the game. The atmosphere is still great. But what was fun about that is that I had a son who's at state uh, a few rows up in the stands on to my right, and my niece, my brother's daughter, is at state just on the opposite side. And then uh, Joe Rexroad. I think I mentioned I mentioned him earlier. He's a long time. This is the friend. Joe Rexroad show now. He he was up there to get his son, and he decided to take in a game. So. At halftime, I got to see him and, I, and my boy and my niece and uh, and this really fun atmosphere, and it was a great game. So that that was kind of unexpected. Helped make up for the the long commute and uh, the snow drifts. It was a, not a fun night to drive up there, and and you know coming back at two in the morning. That's that's you know whatever. But uh, the game itself, the atmosphere, you just forget, man. The the, the, the college basketball is. Like I said, it's uh, the NBA skill level is what appeals to me the most, but but the college basketball environment is hard to beat. It, oh it's, yeah, it's really well, for a good game, for a big game, it's really hard to beat. Breslin, Breslin is definitely what top. Uh, oh, I, I think we talked about this for Breslin Yost. Um, Yost is awesome. Yeah, old Joe Lewis was this way. Yeah, um, 
I mean, Tiger three. Stadium used to be that way too, right? The yeah. way, well, it wasn't the prettiest well, stadium, but the way it was built and 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 closed. The energy, though, I'm talking about the it, energy. It kept it when there were big games there. It kept noise. I mean, I was there for uh, in the '80s as a fan, actually, when they played Toronto at the end of the season and squeaked into the playoffs in '87, and and the way that place kept noise in mm. because the way it was built, you know, yeah. Yeah. Was was pretty great, but you're right. The energy Yost is Yost and Breslin are the best. Yeah, yeah, hard to beat. Yeah, it's it's really hard to beat. Anyway, anything else you want to say before you take us out? Hopefully, no, kindly. I just want to know when Joe Rexford's officially going to join the the name of the pod. You dropped his name like three or four times already in this podcast. So, uh, by the way, nice of Joe to like uh, come get his kid and be like, no, 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 we're gonna go, we're gonna go to the state game so I can see hide, hide all my cronies and get. Uh, the back slaps and everything else, right? Yeah, no, it's good to see him for sure. Yeah, hey, yeah, he's still in Nashville. He's in Nashville. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a heck of a dad to drive up and get your boy for Thanksgiving break. You know, just coming to see the game. Uh, no, not it's really. But anyway, Nashville. anyway. Uh, so, who do we need to thank? Go ahead. Do we need to thank? Um, oh, producer. I don't know, Robin. Robin Chan, our our, our intrepid fill-in <laughs> producer this week. I know we're oh, we're, we're we used to use uh, thinking about Andrew, but that's okay. you know what we need to get Robin's name on there all the time now because Andrew just takes the glory, and but Robin does all the dirty work behind the scenes. So that's true. we're gonna start. He's gonna be listed now all the time as a producer, and thanked. Um, let's thank Andrew Hammond too, even though he's not here with us right now. Um, on a little bit of a hiatus. He's here with us in spirit. Um, his his presence is always appreciated and executive producers and oh my lord sean anjanette delgado we have not mentioned her name this this is this will be our last podcast um as we know it and kirkland crawford co-executive producer and the big guy the big kahuna the big cheese uh peter batia you got kahuna on the mind hawaii man Kahuna, oh man, you you have to go. I'll tell you one quick little thing. I know this is going to get too long, and Corey or Kerry Jr. is going to cut it off. But uh, the funny thing is, I had a friend who used to cover Cal football in the Bay Area, and they were covering the the big game, the Cal Stanford, and the winner of that game I think went to like the Alamo Bowl, and the loser of the game went to the Hula Bowl. So all the beat respective beat writers were rooting for their team to lose to go to the Hula Bowl. So that they could go to Hawaii instead of the stupid uh, San Antonio, wherever the the Alamo Bowl, right, has to be San Antonio. Um, so uh, that was that was uh, fun times in California when they would they go to Cal. I think Cal still plays in the Hawaii, the Maui Invitational. Hey, San Antonio is not bad, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, San Antonio or uh, Honolulu. Well, no, I can see why you like Maui. Hawaii. You, you think know, about you, it. You lean towards the colonizer vibe, you know. So I can see why you like Hawaii. I, uh, you know, yeah. You're no, saying uh, the Alamo is my people, is what you're saying. Yeah, no, right? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying San Antonio. <laughs> San Antonio is a cool place. With a lot I've of never great, been. I've always wanted to go to the river. A lot of great food. Yeah, you have to food. show me the, the Mexican, the real authentic Taco Bells. And oh, I went to a uh, Carnitas place there. Oh my! All they sell are Carnitas, <laughs> and they make tortillas, and they have pintos, and that's it. Ooh, and a little tiny shack. Oh my goodness! All right, that's that's for another. <laughs> Sorry, Kerry. Yeah, we we. We can't get off on that. I think, I, yeah. Anyway, all right, my man. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for hanging out with me and putting up with me for another week. You can find us, Carlos, wherever you find your far- favorite podcasts: Spotify, Apple. When you get there, give us a, uh, give us a rating, subscribe. Makes it nice and easy to get alerts, so you can hear, hear the dulcet tones of Carlos Menares. Until next week, uh, when we will be back with more. Free Press Sports with Carlos and Sean. Thanks for for joining us. We'll talk to you soon. If you like what you heard and you want some more Carlos, you want some more Sean, you can find them on the Free Press website and wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't worry, if you're looking for more on-the-line content, we've got a special episode coming this Tuesday. See you then.